South Africa's financial sector recently marked a significant milestone in the ongoing journey to modernize our payment ecosystem with the adoption of a new global messaging standard. ISO 20022 will enable a harmonized message exchange mechanism for payments across the globe, allowing for richer, better quality data in payment processing and settlements. South Africa is one of the first countries on the African continent to achieve this transition. The adoption of the ISO 20022 format is part of the ongoing journey to reform various pillars of our domestic payment system, including the Electronic Funds Transfer or EFT debit system, the EFT credit system, as well as our domestic real-time gross settlement system, the South African Multiple Options System, or SAMOS. The migration to ISO 20022 brings us closer to realizing the aims of Vision 2025, a safer, more efficient, and more accessible national payment system. South Africa's financial sector recently marked a significant milestone in the ongoing journey to modernize our payment ecosystem with the adoption of a new global messaging standard. ISO 20022 will enable a harmonized message exchange mechanism for payments across the globe, allowing for richer, better quality data in payment processing and settlements. South Africa is one of the first countries on the African continent to achieve this transition. The adoption of the ISO 20022 format is part of the ongoing journey to reform various pillars of our domestic payment system, including the Electronic Funds Transfer or EFT debit system, the EFT credit system, as well as our domestic real-time gross settlement system, the South African Multiple Options System, or SAMOS. The migration to ISO 20022 brings us closer to realizing the aims of Vision 2025, a safer, more efficient, and more accessible national payment system. South Africa's financial sector recently marked a significant milestone in the ongoing journey to modernize our payment ecosystem with the adoption of a new global messaging standard. ISO 20022 will enable a harmonized message exchange mechanism for payments across the globe, allowing for richer, better quality data in payment processing and settlements. South Africa is one of the first countries on the African continent to achieve this transition. The adoption of the ISO 20022 format is part of the ongoing journey to reform various pillars of our domestic payment system, including the Electronic Funds Transfer or EFT debit system, the EFT credit system, as well as our domestic real-time gross settlement system, the South African Multiple Options System, or SAMOS. The migration to ISO 20022 brings us closer to realizing the aims of Vision 2025, a safer, more efficient, and more accessible national payment system. South Africa's financial sector recently marked a significant milestone in the ongoing journey to modernize our payment ecosystem with the adoption of a new global messaging standard. ISO 20022 will enable a harmonized message exchange mechanism for payments across the globe, allowing for richer, better quality data in payment processing and settlements. South Africa is one of the first countries on the African continent to achieve this transition. The adoption of the ISO 20022 format is part of the ongoing journey to reform various pillars of our domestic payment system, including the Electronic Funds Transfer or EFT debit system, the EFT credit system, 
as well as our domestic real-time gross settlement system, the South African Multiple Options System, or SAMOS. The migration to ISO 20022 brings us closer to realizing the aims of Vision 2025, a safer, more efficient, and more accessible national payment system. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I um, just want to see by thumbs up if you guys can all hear me, all the technicalities are, are, are okay, and we can move forward straight into to, to today's session. Just give a moment, thumbs up, perfect. Good morning and welcome everybody to an exciting, exciting event. I'm sure you guys watched that video a couple of times and it was on repeat. So we actually don't even need this session. You guys got all the information already. But really that video really just highlights the magnanimous and this prestigious event that we actually all here participating in and actually reflecting on because this is one of the most exciting first again uh, for South Africa for the continent. And I don't know about you, but I already got a bit of festive type of vibes coming up, considering it is nearly, uh, what's it, two, two months in counting until the end of the year. So with that, I think this is something to definitely celebrate and something to keep in mind as we close off this year. I mean, this is this today's messaging and you, what you'll be hearing from the speakers is that this is a demonstration of constructive collaboration right across various sections. I mean, this is such a meaningful project, you know, and it's not just good for performance ratings, but really at the end of the day for advancing or at least furthering the efficiency and the syn synchronicity of payments. So this is really a moment just to reflect and I like switching up things a bit now that I have the, the opportunity, uh, but I really also want to do a little bit of a vote of thanks. Thanks to you to everybody that has participated in this. There's a lot of people that uh, could could also join me on on this on this panel discussion, you know. But we just want to extend our thanks, our our home home uh, uh contributions that was was provided, and really just just say that this is really a celebration of everybody that's participating and has in some shape or form played their role. So without further ado, my name is Larry Cook. I am from Legal Services Department. And once again, I am honored to be your master of ceremony. And today we are on another purposeful journey or continue with this purposeful journey of Saab, where we really get an opportunity to connect the dots. But I think the essence of connecting dots sometimes is realizing that we are the dots. And with this, I want to bring another dot onto the table so I can connect with her and I will be welcoming uh, Nomawazi Skenjana, who is Saab's NPSD Divisional Head of the Regional and Domestic Settlements Division. She's also the RTGS Renewal Program Owner and the uh, responsible to ensure that the ISO 2 uh, 222 migration was executed successfully as part of the program within Saab. So without further ado, I welcome you. Uh, I'm going to hand over to her to set the scene and just give, just, just give us a checkpoint as to where we find ourselves right now. Over to you, Norms. Norms, you might be on mute. Sorry, that's one of the most popular errors with virtual meeting. Uh, to echo Thank you, Larry, for, for the, the introduction. I, to echo your sentiments, I, we're really thankful to the attendees today to come and share with us this uh, celebration of a, a major milestone in our payments industry. And uh, we are very thankful and grateful to the entire community for rallying together to bring this uh, you know, significant milestone which we cannot uh, undermine where it's going to take us going forward. Uh, there's many people that have been involved and we take cognizance that every it's been sleepless years and especially the go live weekend people worked around the clock and we remain thankful and grateful to those that were instrumental into bringing this milestone to life. Uh, where, what is ISO? Where are we coming from with ISO? ISO is a journey that the country you know, started in the fourth quarter of 2016 with the main uh, objective of uh, joining the creation of uh, and participating in the common language to uh, model uh, payments data across the globe. 
So this is to, to establish that common language so that we are able to talk to each other as, as payment systems, as payment infrastructures, making it easy for connectivity and integration. So when we started in 2016, there was a lot of work that had to be done, decisions that had to be made, whether we're going for like for like, or else we start you know, from scratch in, in, in terms of uh, paving our way and interpreting our business model. And, and our panelists will be taking us through today in, in, in terms of those approaches and what it meant and what we considered in moving into this direction. This milestone brings us close and, and, and contributes in achieving the Vision 2025 goals that were set for the national payment system, which one of them is the transparency and public accountability. Uh, in the richness of the message uh, 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 content, it will help us to achieve this goal. And the SAMU system is a, a settlement system for the country, and it enables a high value payments, which is, you know, in terms of value, 90% of the payments that flow into the country. So you can imagine that 90% of payments will now be on a international standard. That is a major achievement for us. In the Vision 2025, regional integration is part of the goals that have to be achieved and interoperability as well. Now, considering that we are part of um, SADC, we are part of Africa, we are part of the world, connectivity is key. We are starting to see RTGSs interlinking to improve uh, cross-border flows. And uh, this is one integration and, and regional and linkages of RTGSs is, is one of the building blocks of the CPMI in its attempt to resolve frictions in cross-border payments. So we are very proud to be, you know, part of the front runners in implementing the standards. In the, in, 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 in the recent years, uh, uh, people have been talking about the fourth industrial revolution, and we've all interpreted what it means in our world. And in, in my view, connectivity is one of the, you know, breakthroughs of the fourth industrial revolution. So when we solve, you know, the fundamentals and, and, and have a universal standard like we have, it, it, it is a first point to enable us to be able to talk the same language as I, in this, uh, as I indicated earlier. So when did South Africa um, go live with its uh, ISO migration? On the weekend of the 17th to the 19th of September, uh, it was a big weekend for us. We went live with this ISO migration, which positioned our country to be amongst the early adopters and successfully completed the transition for high value payments. And I've already painted the picture that in our jurisdiction, high value payments constitute 90% of the value of payments that move between, you know, uh, in, in the country between uh, counterparties. So we opted for a phased approach for a reason when we decided that all participants will transition with this migration and uh, necessary upgrades will be done to the SAMOS uh, as our central infrastructure to enable uh, us to process these new message standards. We then deployed a, a, a translator. And, and this translator was intentional because it assisted us to be able to process these messages while SAMOS is undergoing a complete upgrade. And it, this phase in approach, you know, constitutes 80% of the change. When we have uh, migrated our industry, 20% would be left with upgrading the central infrastructure, which is part of the SAMOS upgrade. And this enables us to understand and mature our flows using the new standards whilst we're getting ready to program the new system. And, and that informs us to be able to do, you know, what has settled and matured in the industry with little interruptions or, you know, changes that still have to be investigated. 
And, and that being said, we, we take cognizance that some of our participants have placed uh, uh, translators in front of their core systems because we have uh, a big network of, of payment streams and not all core systems could be upgraded at the same time. But that allows us to you know, continue with the upgrade and get ready as the deadline approaches in 2025. SWIFT has given us a, a, a deadline that all major systems should, all, uh, all payment systems should be uh, on the new ISO standard until uh, 2025. So in us discontinuing the MT, it is a conscious decision that we'll do it as a phase approach because there are different payment streams that the banks participate in. So this is a, 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 a very strategic intentional move on our part. Uh, I have mentioned that uh, we're we migrating from a messaging standards that offered at little structure and information was poorly compressed and uh, there was no room for cross-checking and a lot of manual work had to be done. Now we're moving to a standard that offers us flexibility to respond to uh, changes in the industry. The migration allows us to reach a better quality data. It allows us to improve our anti-money laundering and sanction screening, which is a key compliance in our region. It allows us to improve analytics through enhanced data, so less manual work, and uh, uh, we, we then achieve higher rates of straight through processing. Uh, speed has become one of the fundamental underlying, you know, capabilities that our customers demand when they're making payments. The high resilience of the system will be improved through interoperability. And, and we stand proud that as a part of a broader community, it then enables us to harmonize cross-border payments. So as we celebrate today, uh, I will give back to, to Larry to, to introduce the panel, but I would like to reflect that we're gonna be talking about this journey and how we experienced it. We're gonna be talking about the critical success factors and the challenges we experienced. I mean, it, it, it is understood that a program of this nature yeah, will not come without challenges. Of course, we experienced challenges and we and, and tackled the challenges. And coming out of that, we have lessons that we have learned and as a part of the broader community, we are now sharing those lessons learned and the recommendations for future implementation. So it is intentional that we invited our SEDEC uh, colleagues and SEDEC community to be part of this um, uh, session today so that we share the experience. So let me, allow me to hand over to, to Larry to introduce the rest of the panel. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Noms. Thanks for that. You know, your reflections are very insightful. In fact, it's like, I want to say it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a revolutionary uh, uh, transition that's actually taken place. I mean, the SWIFT uh, MT systems, uh, I believe it was conceived in 1970s, and now we're sitting in uh, 20, 2022, and now we, we're taking this, this, this journey, as you said, and our panelists will be able to unpack it further because now we're at a stage where we're not just looking at payments uh, uh, as binary payments, but rather looking at the transaction as a whole with such rich information and data, who knows where we're going to go to next. In fact, are we just keeping up or actually setting the trend for, for new, new developments coming, coming forth from the industry? So really exciting for that. So without further ado, to connect and continue further connecting these dots, I am going to first maybe pause for a little bit of housekeeping. You will notice that if there's any questions that you guys have or want to pose to the panelists, please use the box on the bottom right uh, of the WebEx tool. You will see there's a three buttons, three dots, or there's, a, there's a, like a speech bubble. Just click on that and specifically put it in where it says Q&A. So where it says Q&A, please drop in those questions. I'll pause from time to time and, and see whatever questions we get or reflections we have on the chat and bring that into the room. So we do want you to be included and participate in this conversation that we're having, especially because of our de delegatory network that we have right across various sectors, uh, divisions. So please be free and welcome to pop in any questions that you'd like the panelists to unpack or any reflection being part of this journey. So, uh, 
to add to the panelists and what will take place is I will also just ask the panelists to show themselves on camera while we discuss specific points so that our audience can also see the names and faces if they're not already familiar with them. But without further ado, the first one of our first panelists is Kilani Mukwena. She is the Saab NS NPSD Samos uh, Real-Time Growth Settlement Senior Analyst. Uh, the business leads overseeing and managing the Samos business and functional, functional requirements, internal and industry testing, Samos training and stakeholder engagement between Samos and the industry, as well as the implementation. So welcome. Uh, then we have Masejo uh, Jab Jabusijo, uh, who is Saab's BSTD technical deliver uh, delivery lead, uh, managing requirements, system changes, testing and implementations of the core Samos RTGS and web applications. Welcome. Then we have Ian Curry Black, Saab's BSTD, a SWIFT lead, uh, team lead, responsible for the information technology infrastructure, providing services to the domestic and regional service division of the National Payment Systems Department. Welcome. Then we have Charmaine Thiat, uh, Net, uh, she's from NetBank's Payments Operations General Manager, uh, the chairperson also for the Intermediate, intermediate set, uh, Settlement Payment Clearing Housing Participation Group and the project owner for the modernization of high value payments. Welcome. We also have Sean Moulton uh, from APSA, APSA Technology, Head of Research and Development, subject matter and expert, uh, subject matter expert for the ISO, I, I, ISO standards. Welcome. And then we have, last but definitely not least, Mariki Mincha, who's from the Payments Associations of South Africa Operations Support Manager. And she will be she provides operation supports to the ISO 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 222 migration. Welcome. Oh, that was a mouthful from my side. Uh, and I am going to now hand over to the panelists. And the first topic, I see all the beautiful faces on the panel, so welcome. I will ask that uh, for the first conversation to start, which we will be just really dissecting and unpacking the ISO. ISO uh, 222 migration journey, and I'd ask Shemaine, Sean, and to Kailani to to please welcome me on, join me on the screen. And I would like to start in hearing your guys, guys, guys thoughts in terms of how did you find this journey, what is this journey, and where is this journey taking us to? And please feel free, popcorn style, pop in your heart, open floor. So, I mean, how do we follow something like NOM? So, Nimal Wazi, thank you so much because you make our job as panelists so much easier. And thank you very much to everybody for joining this session. Um, you know, I feel like I'm amongst friends that I have been on a journey with for many years, uh, to some extent, even family members by now. Uh, we've worked so closely and intimately together. Um, and really, I, I really want to say thank you to everybody for this uh, major transition and what, what we've achieved as a community. You know, the project manager from a modernization of high value payments uh, perspective in the Parza domain is Noshin Kader. And I look back and I, I laugh so much at her saying, we need to acknowledge what we've been through. So I'm not gonna bore everybody with the detail, but I do think that there's some things we just need to take a step back and, and just refresh ourselves in terms of this. So Noms, when she did her opening um, comments, really spoke about when we started this in 2016. And uh, I, remember, I remember that day very, very clearly because a letter was then sent uh, from the NPSD through to Parza. At that stage, it was actually sent through by Edward Leach, who has obviously since uh, moved on. And it was directed to Walter Falker, who's also moved on. Um, so it's important to have that context but the letter was actually issued on the 1st of April 2016. So, I mean, that's April Fool's joke. And I remember <laughs> sitting back saying, is this an April Fool's joke? Uh, because this is going to be something really monumental and going to go down in history books. But to be truthful, the journey had actually started way before then, um, you know, as Noshin and I have, have had time to really, um, you know, understand where we were to know where we are going in, in terms of that. Um, and and it's, it's, it's quite easy to become nostalgic and, and be derailed in terms of this. 
But some people will argue that the journey from an ISO perspective actually started as early as 2009, 2009 um, off the back of a competition commission inquiry that was held, where really it spoke a lot to how it was important for us to provide more detail to consumers, particularly off the back of debit orders. So depending on where you sit in the field, and, and certainly if you look at my hairdresser, um, I was where I was there and part of the journey in 2009, and arguably that's where it started, and, and Sean will be able to fill you in a lot more in terms of that. But from a high value payments perspective, and in terms of being able to modernize where we are from an RTGS perspective, we kicked off that journey around about 2012, off the back of a PASA EPC structure, where they were looking at really trying to respond not only to um, you know, the, the changing environment that we were operating in, but also to try to ensure that there was alignment in terms of where Saab, um, the National Treasury, and other regulators, for that matter, were heading, and where they were trying to do is to really create some future proofing in terms of that. Um, so in 2012, in response mainly to the Division 2015, it was as where we started this journey. Sean, I'm not sure if you want to add anything to that. Hi, everyone. Um, so, I mean, as uh, uh, both Sean and our opening speaker has stated, as part of Vision 2025 and the PASA modernization journey, um we as a uh, country in itself um have had a few let's call it africa firsts and we've had a, a, a few global firsts so um if anybody can remember our debit check ac system um that uh, went live i mean that's a global first from a uh let's call it solution perspective yes a number of countries introduced um using the iso messages but we as a country took it a bit further where we actually included the authentication components and to me that's where it started uh today uh if we look where we are at we've done the ac components we've done the high value uh, we're currently busy with RPP. Uh, we've got CBPR starting in a month's time. Um, and then 2023, 2024, 2025 is uh, the next components that we will start looking at. We've got EFT debits and EFT credits. Um, so the journey in itself, I think, is part of what needs to be done. A lot of modernization needs to take place and we've got to start somewhere. Um, so yes, the uh, journey is not far from finished. We've got another three, four years to go. Um, and Talani, any thoughts from your side? Yes, I'd just like to latch on to Shemaine that um, in 20, 2015, when we made that decision to uh, back on this ISO journey, uh, we should remember that from the operator perspective, we were actually going to replace the RTGS. And we further down the process, we unfortunately, we went through the RFP process, um, identified a service provider, and unfortunately uh, could not continue with them. And then we had to place um, the RTGS uh, replacement project on hold. However, further to that, because we had a, done a lot of work with the industry, we took a decision to continue. And then from a SAMOS point of view, we had to uh, find ways of supporting um, the industry with the migration. And to Norm's point earlier, this is where we um, developed uh, or implemented the translator to do that conversion of the MX messages that came from the participants to settle in SAMOS, uh, because SAMOS is still in MT and similarly um, return the confirmations in MT and translate them back to the participants in ISO. So one of the challenges we experienced is that because we are still, uh, our system is still ISO, um, we had to find a way of actually simulating incoming in, uh, instructions from the participants um, 
that would be ISO and therefore we had to build ourselves um, an ISO generator internally uh, so that we could stimulate that end-to-end -end process. And then uh -huh. combined um, the testing, uh, we had a combined testing approach with the industry. And I think one thing that I'd like to mention is that we also um, wanted to migrate our third level contingency system to ISO, which could not happen um, in this phase, but we will still have a look into. Um, so for now, we put it on hold and our testing went well. Um, our RF3 was concluded successfully. And here we are um, on the 17th of September, we managed to implement ISO. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's always good to be a part of history, even if you are just looking from the sidelines or spectating. But really, you guys really set out this this mammoth of a journey, really. And we're not even done yet. But even in our strides, we we making great progress, great African first, great South African first specifically. So really, this is this is really a good setting tone for for the continued conversation. With that being said, I'd like Sean Kelani to just remain on on visual. And then if I can please ask, uh, Mas uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about uh, Maseko, please join. Can you can you join us? We're going to be talking about the critical success factors. Uh, in fact, Kelani, you already were alluding to some of the challenges which we'd get into next. But I think let's 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 set out the goals. What were the what were the pillar points that we had to Critically land. If you guys want to just unpack on that, and maybe I can start by saying, Maseko, do you want to uh, kick 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 the discussion off, perhaps? Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Larry, and everyone for joining. I think um, from a critical uh, success factor, one of the things that uh, we managed to achieve with this uh, migration, I think uh, Talani and Noms have already alluded to it, was um, we enabled um, innovation. And um, they did mention that uh, we introduced uh, translation to be able to uh, translate um, uh, MX messages uh, to MT. And uh, that was done in uh, collaboration with um, IBM and our internal uh, colleagues. And how we achieved that uh, milestone was uh, we embarked on a, on, a, on a POC concept journey where we got uh, our in-house um, developers to develop a translator and also IBM to develop one. And the two solutions were compared, but unfortunately the IBM translator solution was the more uh, appropriate solution for our needs. But um, that does not say that our one was not better, but yeah, that's that's one of the key uh, milestones that uh, we achieved. Uh, I think also Talani mentioned the uh, ISO generator that was also uh, built um, in-house. Uh, that tool also um, assisted us with um, generating our own ISO messages to simulate uh, back office um, applications. And we're also currently using that tool actually to automate our testing and uh, to generate our, our volume messages when doing when testing our applications. And I think uh, furthermore to add on the innovation uh, bandwagon, um, we also did a technical landscape upgrade on our Samex web application. Uh, we changed the look and feel and uh, refreshed it a bit. And I'm sure the participant uh, can attest to the fact that it's looking more um, appealing. And um, yeah, that's 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 my take from an innovation uh, point of view. And I think um, probably um, the others can add on onto that uh, bandwagon as well. Sean, perhaps you want to contribute? Yeah, so I mean, from my perspective, uh, the let's call it critical success factors and actually taking our learnings from our previous ISO projects. Um, and the previous mm -hmm. one was AC, I'm going to mention it again, um, and making the appropriate decisions related to those lessons learned. So for example, um, getting a tool to assist in the process. ISO um, 2022 is not a um, straightforward, uh, uh, let's call it simple structure in itself. It is a complex structure. Um, we as a country made the decision that we'd be using my standards um as a single tool across the industry 
um, for us to be able to define our standards within it, to have our documentation in it. Um, so it assisted or was one of those uh, success criteria that helped with this process. Um, if we compare it to what we did with AC, um, actually trying to duplicate an ISO structure within a Word document, uh, I think we spent better much of 10 months just trying to get uh, the two doc the the ISO in itself aligned with what we had in the Word document. Cut and paste didn't work so well. Whereas the actual My Standards tool um, assisted a lot in that process uh, without us trying to create these things in other documents. To me, that was one of those um, uh. critical success factors and including let's call it the collective buy-in from the industry um, around all the participants being around the table. Yes, uh, COVID brought a bit of challenges to the table around us all going virtual. Yeah. But I think it's something the industry in itself took in stride, uh, in their stride, and it worked. Um, the virtual boardrooms, we could get more people interacting so mm. in a way it was a blessing in the, the skies going virtual um and the, having that single tool to assist us through the process was um to me one of those uh, critical success factors awesome awesome Kleani, you want to maybe uh bring it home for us uh just want to bring in a voice from norma she's mentioning in the chat she's saying that the iso 20 2022 uh standard creating a common language and a modern a model payments data across the globe which is really phenomenal uh, i don't know do you want to maybe add on to that in terms of your from your perspective um Larry, i think from my side i have a long list very long list of <laughs> successful uh, factors however among one of them i just to add on to what Masako and um sean had said uh, from the operator perspective we managed to um have MasterCard, which is one of our PSOs, settled directly on Samos because they are currently using one of our bigger banks um, as a sponsoring bank for settlement in Samos, which um, posed a risk in the sense that should anything happen to that bank, um, there would be um, it would have an impact to both MasterCard, the bank, and the market as a whole. Um, we also got to um, onboard um, Visa as well, who also made, is now settling directly uh, on Samos. Uh, current, previously, they were using uh, BankServe um, to settle all their batches. Uh, from a SAMEX web perspective, we uh, incorporated new functionality um, where participants are now able to capture payments. Um, this would be used in, in a case of a contingency where a participant's network or, uh, or has issues with their, with their uh, system and are unable to capture payments. They can go on the front end application that we from a SAMEX perspective has provided to, to the participants to use. We also got to move retail batches from the RTL line, or which is the real-time line, um, which is uh, basically the immediate settlement line to the delayed settlement line, which is the CBPL. And the reason for this move was um, to maybe minimize the batch um, discard, because if one of the participants did not have sufficient funds um, while the batch settled on uh, the immediate line, the batch would uh, this cut and would have an impact on everybody involved in that batch. So with the CBPL, um, it is a delayed um, settlement method. So even if one of the participants does not have sufficient funds, the, the, uh, the batch will be on hold until funds are available, then the participant uh -huh. can fund and settle the, 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 the batch. I think the other thing that is the success factor for me is the comprehensive test cases that we had and um, that we shared with the industry to ensure that everybody's um, requirements were catered in in the in the test cases to enable um, easy uh, testing and um, to ensure that all scenarios were catered for and that the end-to-end -end processes from the summers and the participant side where we could be tested. Um, I think the other one is, uh, I think we're lucky from a South African perspective to have had representation 
on the HBPS Plus and the CBPR Plus working groups, which were international groups that um, were attended by central banks and some of the commercial banks to discuss um, the standardization of these ISO messages. And um, from the South African perspective on HGPS Plus, we had myself and Dave from Festrand. Dave represented, it was there to ensure that the participants' requirements were uh, communicated and me from the RTG side ensure that um, uh, the SAMOS requirements were um, catered for. And then from the CBPR perspective, we have Sean, who was representing South Africa, and who actually represent Africa to ensure that um, our requirements from a South African perspective were also catered for. And because I think the, the positive thing about this is that when we had sessions, we could actually identify the gaps between HVPS plus messages or usage guidelines and CBPR, and therefore we could align as an industry. Um, and based on that, we decided to have one uh, usage guidelines from, a, uh, from the whole industry that aligned uh, with the CBPR plus uh, messages. Um, and lastly, I think very importantly, we saw this during um, the implementation phase, which is basically resiliency, because um, at some point of, of the implementation, there was a threat of us uh, rolling back. And we stood uh, up as an industry to say, um, we are going to push this through and we are going to make it work. We would rather fix forward than to roll back. And the risk with rolling yeah. back basically was that we hadn't, it hasn't been done in, in South Africa. so. Uh, it was more risky to roll back than to fix forward. Thank you. Oh, that's awesome. No, thank uh, Larry, you so much. Larry? Sure, go ahead, uh, Maseko. Yes, you, so within I just... A few seconds. Yes, three seconds. <laughs> I just wanted to <laughs> add on the back of what um, uh, Talani was saying with regards to um, collaboration and participation. I think um, um, from a SAR perspective, that was uh, very key. Uh, and to give you a bit of background, uh, we did uh, cross-functional departmental work uh, with regards to uh, the project. How it was structured and how we achieved the end goal was in collaboration with uh, NPSD as the operator, um, BSTD as uh, supporting services pro who provided business analysis, developers, testers, operators, SWIFT specialists, and um, integration and change and release management as well, including our um, our IBM vendor as well. So the teamwork and uh, dedication that was uh, portrayed on this uh, project, uh, I must say, it's, it, it's, it's really, 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 really commendable. And and one thing that Lani said about resiliency is um, having resilient resources that, that, that has a drive and enthusiasm to acquire the new skill to deliver this project, I think it was very, very key for us. So yeah, and and one last thing is that that's I think is very key is the the skills that uh, we acquired from the Samos uh, migration uh, has laid a solid foundation for us to also assist and uh, migrate um, SADC RTS ISO uh, implementation. Thank you. No, thanks, Maseko, for that. For that, I'd give you an extra five seconds or ten seconds because that was critical. Uh, Kilani wasn't joking when she said she had a list of uh, success criteria. So, uh, I mean, it just talks to the mammoth task that was at hand and all hands being on deck. I mean, to get a ship moving, it, you need everybody. I mean, from the sails to the downstairs and the engine is just wild. So this is really just just uh, tribute to how big a task it was and how cross-functional teams and collaboration amongst amongst peers is is important, you know, and it's outside, not just looking at what, what benefits us, but what actually serves the the wider community. So that is really, really commendable. Uh, ladies, I am and gents, uh, Sean. <laughs> I'm going to pause just for a second just to ask uh, Alison, the PMO, if there's any questions perhaps on the chat, because now we're going to get into the more juicier port, not the more juicier ports parts, but we're going to be seeing what 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 the challenges experience and how these were addressed. I think this was was slightly alluded to, but before we get into that, uh, I'm not sure if there's any questions, Alison, that you want to bring to the table. I'm not picking up any at the moment, Larry. I think just let it go more. Um, okay. My participants would correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not seeing anything at the moment. Let's proceed. Thank you so much. 
No, perfect. And I do want to encourage all of you guys to send messages, thoughts, reflections, even if you just want to share a comment or a congratulation. You know, um, it's always this, or oh, I find myself when I MC these type of settings, it's like a radio talk show. You're not sure if there's anyone on the other side, but we hope that there is. So we see some reactions. That's brilliant. Uh, but yeah, if you have any questions, if you want to contribute or share something from your side or something that you've experienced, please feel free to contribute. I do have one question and maybe as a segue into the next topic, and I'll ask that Maseho, Ian and Charmaine join me on the on the on the visuals so that we can unpack the challenges experience and how were they addressed because one question that i have in my mind is saying why only now why did it take so long for us to get here like i can imagine that's only contributory to the challenges that we've experienced but why now from 1970 to 2022 take us on this journey unpack this for us hope con style hop on your heart ian i must say you looking rather dapper in your bow tie uh uh for this auspicious occasion You might be on mute, Ian. I said thank you and, and good morning, everybody. Um, uh, a, a, a lot of what I might touch base with now um, is maybe just at a deeper level of, 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 of uh, concepts that have been put on the table so far. Um, but I think uh, why now? Um, you know, from a from a SWIFT perspective, the, the empty message standard was designed, uh, de designed and defined um, way back from when SWIFT started almost, which was back in 1973, I believe. And um, uh, over time, it, it served its its purpose. But the, the world we we're in today is is um, requiring, you know, the richer data that Noam spoke about, um, the compliance data. Uh, you need to be able to screen payments um, from a sanctions perspective, from an anti-money laundering perspective. So it was really time to to relook at the at the message protocol or the, the structure of the message, and decide how how do we take this uh, forward for the future. Um, then some of the challenges, um, and, and and my colleagues have touched on some of these, uh, was. It, it, ISO has been because it's a, because it's an evolving standard, um, and then and, and alluded to 2009 and 2016 and so on and so forth. There's been a number of releases and updates, and then more recently during our project, um, uh, CBPR, the the uh, Payments Market Practice Group for Cross Border, um, came along, and um, Swift kind of started setting the bar for for cross border payments. And uh, in an order to, to, to maintain our modernization, we, we wanted to stay harmonized um, between the high value space and the cross border space. And in, in context of, of SWIFT, that means that the messages are only different where necessary because it gives outflow to um, the interoperability, uh, the straight through processing, and, and all of the, the, the concepts that my colleagues have, have alluded to in the previous parts of the conversation. Um, still later in the journey, um, uh, we discovered uh, this thing called message validation on the SWIFT network um, to make sure that certain fields um, were conformed uh, in a particular way, like whether it be um, contact-based or, or, or you, 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 there's only certain content you can uh, you can validate. Um, and Again, as Sean alluded to earlier, is we opted to use Swift My Standards, um, and that was the platform where we were able to then um, define these rules and guidelines and so on, um, and publish them um, from a from a single portal to uh, the, the the participants. Um, some of the problems that we had along the way was getting to grips with the underlying technology transport layer on the SWIFT network. Um, while it's been around for a number of years, it was the first time we'd applied it uh, from uh, an ISO 2022 message perspective, at least from the system operator's perspective. Sean did it that other uh, market participants had already uh, started to, to, to utilize it. And there was a number of learnings and challenges we had to overcome there. Um, I think key to to 
to overcoming these problems was having um, SWIFT um, almost as part of the project in our back pockets. We had what they call a single point of contact through a particular engagement that we did with them. Um, and between Sean representing South Africa from a cross-border perspective and um, us having the single point of contact from the operator perspective, we were able to engage with almost at a moment's notice and resolve um, any challenges that we had. Um, I think then also what we realized during the journey was capacity on the project um, from, a, from a human capital perspective in particular. Um, and I believe Boz is going to look at, 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 at putting training mechanisms in place to assist uh, going forward um, with uh, those challenges. Um, some other things would be this several projects. Sorry, Larry, I can't see you. Um, the several projects that, that not only the Reserve Bank, but several of the participants had underway at the same time. Just in context of our own journey, um, the RTGS renewal program um, has five different work packages. So during this journey, in the same time period, um, we've upgraded SOMOS, we've upgraded the web, uh, we've replaced the underlying infrastructure um, that actually runs uh, the payment system as well. Um, and all of these things were, were, were going on um, while the industry and ourselves were developing the, the standards for um, ISO 2022. Um, I don't think I'll speak about COVID. Sean covered that one. And I'll pause there, Larry. I think uh, let's give one of those speakers an opportunity. No, brilliant. Thanks, Ian. Perhaps, Charmaine, do you want to you wanna, wanna add to what? Yeah, yeah. so thanks. Thank you very much, Sean. I mean, I'm not going to take too much time on this one, really, other than to say that we do need to acknowledge that sometimes you, you actually lose by having first move, ad, taking first move advantage becomes uh -huh. a disadvantage. And I think part of it really was to be able to say that the standard itself was busy evolving. And for us to be able to get grips, uh, to, to get to grips in terms of that, Kalani in the earlier session spoke a little bit about, you know, there there was a little bit of disappointment in terms of the modernisation of the RTGS versus then having to do a version upgrade perspective. So I think that there were some challenges in terms of that. And just to put context around this, because of CBPR, our project was actually delayed by a year. Uh, because we, we wanted to make sure that there was alignment, you know, NOMS opened up talking about a common language and one of the vision then 2015 and now 2025, um, and that's how many visions we've had in between this, this project was really about to ensure that we are creating interoperability and that we are able to align to that standard. And that was, it was, it was complex, but those challenges were overcome largely by way of the, uh, by virtue of the way we were engaging as an industry. So this this project would not have been successful if there wasn't collaboration across all of the members. And I'm going to say 30 odd because we need to acknowledge that during the course of this project, members joined and members left, banks left the country, banks started, they joined Samos. And I think that's not visible to everybody in terms of, of what we actually went through from, from this. And that challenge really of making sure that that coordination, making sure that all of the members understood this takes priority. I think that was really something that we managed really, really well. And it really had an opportunity, if not managed appropriately through the PASA structures, through the SAB structures, to be able to make sure that, that as participants are joining, as they are leaving, that front of mind and, and top priority was really to make sure that this project landed. It became a national imperative. You know, Nom speaks about speed. That certainly is applicable to all payments and talks about safety. And certainly that was really what we were aiming for. So, so some of those challenges that we are not, that's not visible to everybody was, was really around that. And then I think we need to acknowledge that the standard was evolving, meaning that there wasn't really an expert on this. Uh -huh. And we needed to make sure that everybody understood what the standard was and the impact to the overall safety. Mm. No, I'm not sure um, if anybody wants to add to that. Masejo, perhaps do you want to take it home for us? Okay, so uh, it doesn't mean that I'm airing out our laundry, but uh, with any project, <laughs> there will be challenges. Mm -hmm. So I think one of one of the key challenge that uh, we experienced. Uh, 
from a delivery perspective was uh, predefined timelines. Like everybody was saying, we 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 know we knew what our end uh, target was, but uh, we had to work uh, backwards. So predefined timelines was uh, a key thing that uh, really challenged us. But um, with with the collaboration that we we had within the Saab, we we obviously had to to come up with uh, creative ways to 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 reach uh, our our end goals. Um, we had to combine um, resources. We 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 had no uh, boundaries drawn. If uh, there was an issue on uh, testing, everybody would jump in and um, assist. So uh, predefined uh, timelines was uh, a, a huge constraint for us. And uh, another one I want to touch on, um, it was uh, training. I think uh, training, ISO training also really, really, really was a yeah. challenge for us uh, because when the program started, like everybody said pro program started, it started way back in 2019. And at that time, uh, no one knew anything because it was it was just a learning for everyone. So at that point in time, we only had um, basic training, and we never went back to say that guys, the the project is in momentum. How can we share knowledge? How can we uh, uh, share knowledge with anyone who is coming into the project and and going out? So um, uh -huh. how we mitigated that uh, challenge was. Um, I think uh, Sean and Ian spoke about it. We mostly learned uh, from my standards uh, and with uh, consultations uh, from the industry. Um, those are the two key things that uh, really help us to gain the momentum on uh, training. Wow. Okay, wow, that is a, a lot. And I'm sorry if I'm pressing for time, but you know, at the more I listen to you guys, we could we should have we could have a whole half day session and unpack this because the wealth of information that's coming from yourself, Ian, Shabane, and all the other participants as well, like you realize that you guys basically are building a plane, having jumped off the cliff, but you're not just building a plane, you're building a fleet of airplanes while jumping between different planes to get them all up and running before you guys hit the ground. So really well done. Uh, and yeah, it's just, again, testimony to how, how big a task was at hand and how successful this is uh, at this point in time. Uh, I want to move on to now the lessons learned. So I'll ask Charmaine, Kelani, and uh, Mareki if you can please join me on the visuals. And perhaps let's 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 bring it home as we have one more point to discuss regarding recommendations. But let's just see what's what are the lessons learned that we can take away because we have a lot of participants that are joining that are also yet to take this journey or or have already started this journey. And perhaps there's key insights as to how to begin, how to start, what to be wary of. So over to you guys. Go ahead. Ladies, not guys. <laughs> Pop in your heart, uh, Mariki. Maybe from you, we have a new face, a new voice. Uh, unmute Absolutely, and, thank yeah. you, sir. Absolutely, uh, and thank you for that, Larry. And good morning to everyone. Um, uh, just sitting here and listening to um, the experts on this call, and it's taking me back to that 2009 journey that we started off and. Um, when we then originally started discussing our modernization in 2016, um, although we all knew ISO 20022, we had no clue what it was um, going to bring to us and the the complexity around it. Um, it, it has been a fantastic journey and um, a blessing to be actually involved in the collaboration and the debates and the discussions and the disagreements, but at least there was more agreements than disagreements, which we led to bring us to an awesome um, release from an ISO 2022 perspective um, and for the better from uh, SAMPS perspective. But what did it bring us to um, during all these collaborations and discussions? Um, Maseko was leading to that is because there was not that knowledge base, it actually brought that knowledge base from an ISO 2022 perspective. All our deliberations and discussions brought that knowledge to us. Um, it also assisted um, our SWIFT partner to introduce the, the SWIFT smart platform um, where all these additional learnings can be achieved from an industry perspective. And I would really advise everybody that hasn't been there yet to please go and reach out to that. 
Um, and then what Sean was mentioning, <coughs> my standards. My standards gave us an opportunity to actually present something as a community and we all had the same hymn street that we could sing from. There was no misinterpretation. Um, there was no um, things that we couldn't understand because we had my standards. Um, and I just want to say lastly, I, I really would uh, uh, reach out to everyone that is on the call. If there is uncertainty from an ISO 2022 perspective, to please reach out to the PASA um, environment to, so that we can assist in that clarification um, and, and, and assist with making it better for everyone as well, but also to guide and support in giving you that ISO 2022 information, but also from a my standards perspective. Um, and I will leave it in my, the capable hands of Kalani and Charmaine to continue on that basis. Thank you, team. I think I would then latch to uh, Mariki's um, comment there around the messages. I think one of the lessons learned from us uh, is that uh, we believe we should have uh, first completed the messages um, and agreed on the message standards and the fields first before we had started development. Because as the messages changed, development changed, and we also had um, Swift develop um, a, to, uh, an application called uh, MVAL, which was the message validation that needed to use those message guidelines, the usage guidelines on my standard um, to build an application to validate our messages. So um, that is a lesson learned to first um, finalize the messages and then to do the development afterwards. Um, in terms of the documentation, especially around the FRS, we had um, the green areas, which were basically um, the interaction of either the PSO or the banks with other third parties. Um, I think we, we never really delved uh, too much into the green areas, uh, which we found ourselves in a trouble a bit uh, later in the project in that um, we we missed out some of the third parties which had an, a huge impact on, on the industry processes that we actually needed to take them along in this journey to, to develop a, 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 and migrate ISO um, with the rest of the industry. Um, I think the other thing from our side is probably in future try to do a semi-agile testing between the SAMOS operator and the participants in that um, so that we are able to pick up issues later and not have to wait for the end to pick up issues and then stress and have to rush everything um, to, to, to resolve issues. And by this, I mean, for example, if we then have a plan to maybe uh, develop for Apex 8 as an industry, we all test it in an agile format until all the messages have been uh, completed. Um, one other thing from our, our internal learnings is to have done a knowledge transfer to our supporting departments. It does not help uh, you have other departments supporting you who do not understand your process. So you need to take them along in this journey or have sessions with them um, to do that knowledge transfer about what your projects are about um, and then um, so that uh, they are able to to ensure seamless support to mm. to, 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 to the to them. To, to, to your project. Um, I'll leave it there and um, allow Shamin to continue. Thanks, Solani. Yeah, so, so as a modernization of high value payments project perspective, we're still actually busy unpacking our lessons learned. But just some strategic themes and perhaps to those participants who have not yet gone on the ISO standard. One of the things, you know, that we, we identified was that our flows were very well documented. And from a requirement perspective, it was truly understood what was required in terms of those, those message formats. But when it came to testing the robustness, robustness in terms of the data quality, Quality is something that was perhaps we could have focused a little bit more on uh, from that perspective. It was assumed that there was a high level of, of testing that was being done in terms of the data quality, which would allow straight through processing within the individual participants environment. 
And then another thing, it's not a learning, it's something that I would like to share as a success rather than a learning, is really to say that governance structures around this really, really make the difference in terms of being able to ensure that there is collaboration, ensure that everybody is aligned, that you have prioritization, that you need to move together as a complete um, uh, you know, unit, um, that you are only as strong as your weakest link. And I think that was done very well from both a Saab, so an NPSD perspective, normal Wazi and Tim really driving that at a leadership perspective, but also from a positive perspective, if we look at the executive oversight and sponsorship that was was uh, held there. And I think one of the last points I think that really mm. is something that needs to be considered is really about making sure that you have resources that remain with you throughout the life cycle of the project. Um, it is incredibly complex. It's far more complex than we have been able to share with you in this uh, very short period of time. And it, it really is quite critical to ensure that you have got people who are completely resourced, understand this very complex subject and are able to see through the life cycle of that. And to a great extent, that is what we were able to achieve from this project. Um, uh -huh. But as we unpack our lessons learned, we'll make, make we'll be certain to, to share that with the rest of the industry as well. That is Thanks. Awesome. I think that's, that's all from me, Larry. Thank you so <laughs> much. Thank you, ladies. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Larry. I think, I think, can I just add one thing to Charmaine's point around? Sure, um, two seconds people leaving i think um one point that we did not touch on is continuous uh, training because we had people coming in and out of the project who have missed a whole chunk of the the information uh -huh. and processes that we had already done so i think with the in future if we could have that continuous training as and when the project progresses to accommodate those ones that are joining the project in late to be aligned with everybody else to moving forward mm, no brilliant point brilliant point ladies i must thank you for the insights I mean, you guys really show in how what systemic thinking is really about, you know, looking at not just the payment, but really the whole transaction and really the life cycle of the transaction, the interconnected components, the systems, the policies, the people, especially double double click on the people, the resources, and really it's it's leadership and also hard work that 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 gets behind this. All of us taking that leadership role at that point in time. So really kudos to the team once again and all the participants who helped us get this far on the journey. So for the next uh, and last point of discussion before we open up for question and answers, answers is the recommendations to future onboarding participants. And I'd ask Ian, Sean and Maseko to please join me on the visuals. And let's 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 unpack the recommendations to future operation uh, onboarding uh, of participants. Uh, who would like to start us off with this discussion? I don't mind kicking off. Please do. I think we need to emphasize um, what has been said in terms of engage, collaborate, and look for partnerships, particularly with your application vendors, um, with original equipment manufacturers of products such as SWIFT um, and the participants. Um, the fact that we did an early engagement with SWIFT back in 2018 um, for implementation assistance um, and we got what SWIFT refers to as a, as a single point of contact to refer to, was absolutely critical, not only during the course of the project, but particularly over the, the implementation weekend. Um, I think it was Talani that mentioned that uh, we, we almost got to an impasse where we thought we were going to roll back at a point in time. And um, because we could collaborate with everybody, we were able to, to drive the, the implementation home. Um, I think one of the other things um, following from that point was uh, when we went through the process of defining our um, uh, functional requirements, specifications, and so on, um, we started out not with the business flows and, and the functions. We started out with a set of principles um, that kind of laid the foundation as guiding principles. So when we were discussing a particular um, message flow, um, and, and there was a tendency to kind of fall back to the way of thinking of the empty world from time to time. Um, you know, someone put up their hand and say, are we being true to those guidelines and principles? And um, we could kind of keep uh, ourselves honest and on track. And even in, in, in later times, one, two years down the line, someone would maybe come back and question a particular um, uh, decision. So we had a decision register um, that was developed and then later on a request for clarification as we went through the, de the development process and, and 
the, the participants and ourselves got to to grips with the nitty gritties of the of the, the new structures and things. Um, so we have a significant repository of of, of information documented, and, and uh, I think Mariki from from Pazo can assist the community with if if anybody's interested in more detail around those. Um, and then. Uh, the other aspects of my standards that I don't think we covered in the conversation so far was something that SWIFT includes in that product um, called the readiness portal, which basically allows you to do uh, a measure of unit testing on individual messages. So even before ourselves and uh, participants had their development work finalized, they could already start checking the, the layouts and the formats to say, are, are they compliant? Um, to what we've what we've defined in my standards, so I think that was also um, critical. Um, and I'll pause there and then hand over perhaps to Sean from that point. Thanks. Yeah. So from uh, my side, um, read, read, and read. Um, there is a lot of uh, information out there um, related to the subject. Uh, and ask questions. Um, ISO in itself is a complex uh, ecosystem. Um, and when deciding to go on the ISO journey, there's kind of two methods. You could do a like for like implementation and there's nothing wrong with that. You could do a, uh, a full implementation uh, from a, we, uh, drop what we have today and we go fully ISO, very similar to the um, implementation that we did in South Africa. Uh, but th that decision kind of needs to be made as early as possible um, because the rest of your journey is actually about that decision. Um, and neither one is right or wrong. The, the decision to go full ISO, the decision to go like for like is what is good for that industry at that point in time, depending on the applications you have in place. But you need to understand with both of them comes complication. Um, you need to understand the differences between transforming a message and mapping a message. Um, in transforming a message, you're just taking it from where it is today into something different. When you're mapping a message is what you map on the outside. And they are two di distinct different um, functions within the process in itself. So, uh, and what I have found, um, and it's not just from a South African perspective, even from a global perspective, there is a lot of confusion. Uh, between the two components. Um, a lot of people are under the impression if I'm doing transformation, I'm done. You need to do mapping when going to, 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 on sending a message. That mapping is very critical in understanding of taking A into B and B into C. So uh, from that perspective, there's a lot of uh, material on the SWIFT website related to these subjects. Um, and there's a lot of training available uh, on this subject itself around how to transform, how to translate, uh, how to do mapping. There's a lot of mapping guidance available uh, for, uh, related to this. So to me, it's guys, you need to read, read and read more. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, Sean. Uh, read, read, read. Uh, Masepo, do you want to okay. take it home for us? Let me uh, let me try to take it home. So, um, my advice for for those who are still to come is, it's very important to have a a good plan, do your capacity building, uh, have a good stress test strategy and training strategy, but. Uh, on the flip side of it, no amount of planning can prepare you for what's lying ahead of you. So all you just need to do is uh, make sure that you are flexible in your approaches and uh, methodology. 
expect the unexpected and um, roll with the punches. That's that's totally very key. And then from a bit of a, a technical perspective, what 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 can help them is they they can implement. Um, automation tools that will assist them with uh, testing to automate their testing. Uh, they must make sure that they allocate more time for testing and make sure that they um, exalt all test scenarios. And then uh, another thing that uh, I think we also picked up is they must make sure that they do um, end to end regression uh, testing. Uh, on the on the components that are not af affected by the ISO migration, because at the end you might find out that um, the downstream applications that were not impacted by the migration uh, uh, are also affected, but yes, uh, yet they didn't uh, test. And I think uh, another one that Talan also alluded to: a continuous learning environment. Make sure that they transfer knowledge. Make sure that uh, training is there, both theoretical, hands-on. And um, all I can say is uh, good luck to them. <laughs> <laughs> no, you. thank you. Thank you. Uh, Before I, I see a, a comment there by Ian, I see your hand is up. Uh, you want to add? Yeah, I see a few seconds. Go to, ahead. To make yeah. an additional comment as well. Um, and uh, one of the, the previous speakers, I think it was Mariki, or one of them said that we at a point in time decided not to include what we regarded as greenfields um, uh, participants. But later on, um, we realized that there's certain key participants or customers of the banks that had to be included um, to avoid unnecessary impact um, on South Africa's liquidity, for example, um, and ability to make certain payments. So we brought our national treasury into the fold um, quite late, uh, approximately this time last year, in fact. And, um, Within 12 months, with the industry collaboration, um, particularly Sean and Mariki's input as well, we assisted them to transform their systems for, for domestic payments as well. Um, and at this point in time, uh, that is on the traditional SWIFT network transport layers, which are not going to be available to other corporates. Um, SWIFT strategy is to move to application program interface uh, um, type delivery. Uh, for corporates in future. So um, that was also quite an important achievement um, in, in this context. Not only did we do the 30 plus banks, as, as Charmaine alluded to, but we took um, uh, one of the, the, the customers of, of the Reserve Bank and, and uh, five or six other banks in the country on the journey too. Wow. Wow. Thanks for that, Ian. Sean, closing remarks? Yeah, just one last closing remark. I see somebody's asked the question around data quality um, and STP rates. What you need to realize as part of this journey in the current domain, if you're on empties, you've spent years perfecting your STP rates, getting the data processing correctly. Going into ISO, you are actually going to restart the journey um, because of the different structures because of a fixed structure because of structured data there's a whole number of uh, components uh, that uh, actually talks to you yes you might have better data quality going forward but you need to learn what they did data quality what to do with it and once you understand what to do with it your stp rates will start increasing again so it, just because your STP rates drop doesn't mean that the actual implementation wasn't successful. Um, your STP rates point to understanding what the actual data is so that you could process it appropriately. Hmm. No, brilliant. Thanks, Sean. In fact, I think you demonstrating again our African nature of resilience and always being forward focus because right now it's time for the question and answer session so i would like all the panelists to join me on the visuals please uh uh come come forth uh alison if i may ask you that you perhaps take us through some of the question and answers and we can ask the panelists to flag them off uh whoever feels they want to answer pop on your heart uh let's let's get the discussion going and get the participants to the call involved alison do you want to take us through the questions that you might have at this point in time Yes, Larry, uh, thank you for that. 
a lot of it more is uh, statements, statements of acknowledgement around uh, appreciating the amount of collaboration that has happened. A comment there coming from Anissa, uh, really appreciating uh, the work that has been done, how the team had pulled together and paved the way forward. Uh, a story that she wants to tell her grandchildren, being a part of a program such as this of this magnitude. Um, I saw Otis also had a question around stakeholder engagement, which I see Rona did respond to him on that. Again, a comment from Monday, just uh, again, also just mentioning to the team and appreciating the collaboration that had happened in this uh, effort between the industry, the PSOs and the ASOs. Um, then we've got Shannon also appreciating being part of this journey as well, appreciating the open, open communication and working together as a team. Uh, Salome talking about the sleepless nights. <laughs> Right uh, to deliver on time, uh, echoed again by Elise around the collaboration and how that's key for success. Um, Jocelyn also citing similar comments around the the collaboration that was required. Um, Wolfram just mentioning that we need to start the journey early, involve your stakeholders early, and you can't stop emphasizing the word engage and engage. Uh, Jean Andre also mentioned that there was some bit of rework that was required, but at times that is is necessary. I did see a question around um, asking for some sort of lecture uh, or some sort of course content uh, that can be put together that he would like to see or, or be shared with the rest of, of the participants. And um, if it's a similar response, we are busy with a publication that really is history in the making. And uh, in collaboration with PASA and PASA Academy, looking at putting together some sort of uh, curriculum that we can, uh, that, that uh, participants can use on this journey. Uh, I'm going to check in with my uh, counterpart, Demita, if she picked up anything from her side, because I have been scrolling and there could be some questions pulling through as I was speaking. Yeah. So, no, perfect. I'd also just perhaps, Alison, if I can also ask the participants that any messages that or any questions we don't attend to, there will be a meet, Mentimeter that will be shared where you guys can then continue mull over some of the concepts that were discussed and you can put it on the Mentimeter. It will be remain open for the next two hours or so post this conversation. So if something pops up when you have a gap in between your meetings, you can, or if you feel that a message uh, question wasn't addressed appropriately, you can type it into the Mentimeter, address it to a specific pa panelist perhaps and we can then revert on that when we further engage. Thanks, but over back over to you, Alison. I see there was a question. So, so what's the question? question? Yeah. yeah, it says knowing that we know, knowing what we know now and in hindsight, always easy. Do you believe we should have a stronger focus on ISO uh, 222 in the AC design going forward? And going forward? Yeah, so uh, whether we did that program first, we would have had struggles we had in AC. Um, the, the, I, the focus on ISO in the AC design was very ISO focused. And uh, the challenges within AC in itself uh, was a lot outside of the ecosystem than in the ecosystem. Uh, the messages, messages in themselves uh, was a lot more complex. There was a lot more messages involved. Um, the Would we change the design as we see it today? Yes, there's maybe one or two things uh, we could have done better. Um, and that's part of the learning curve. Um, we took the learnings out of AC, used it in this program. These learnings out of this program, to me, that could go back into AC uh, from a design perspective, message flow perspective, um, on how we utilized it. Maybe we overemphasized on data in AC a bit, and that's things we learned in this program. So yes, um, it is something that will be taken forward as part of looking at that next phase or when we do uh, the EFT debit as to how the lessons learned from this perspective or this program actually then is brought into that. Uh, 
Okay, brilliant, mm -hmm. Sean. Uh, uh, Alison, perhaps maybe yeah. you can share the Mentimeter question, uh, the, the link, and people can start popping the questions. Because I'd like to wrap it up with the participants conscious of time and just afford them to provide their closing thoughts, you know, just in terms of the discussion at, at length. There were so many aspects, some things that we had to also just summarize uh, conscious of time. But I think at the end of the day, we 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 really take this in high regard of uh, the accomplishment that has been made with the collaborative efforts from all individuals and really just something to reflect on and continue learning uh, as we continue with this purposeful journey. So perhaps uh, while while Alison is ready in the Mentimeter for everybody to 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 continue asking questions perhaps and like I said it will remain open. Let's 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 go around the room and yeah let's let's hear what what you guys have having closing, be it advice, be it reflection points, just be it comments, just what can, can we take away from today's session and the journey that we're continuing? Uh, Larry, if I could just draw your attention to a question that was asked just around the, um, oh, sure. AM, uh, around the AML, it just give me. So sure, let's pause question. there, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Larry. Uh, so with regards, on the AML issues, was there any collaboration with the rele relevant authorities regarding the impact of ISO uh, 222 for AML. And that's posed to anyone on the panel. Thank you. Sean, I'm assuming you're gonna take this AC1 or anyone else, any takers? Uh, so the, uh, the AML component in itself, um, so the, the implementation of ISO um, enhances uh, the AML capability. Um, there is no disadvantage um, in the process in itself. It is one of the, let's call it, second most spoken about uh, topic uh, in the CBPR components as to uh, what are the disadvantages, none. Yes, must the sanction slash slash AML tools um, start learning uh, the new data structures? Yes, it must. But in providing the new data structures, it does make the a AML process a lot more simpler, a lot less complex, uh, because the attributes or the data structures are very um, structured. In other words, address is address street name the street name uh, you don't have a uh, a unstructured structured address you have a structured structured address for uh, I, I i know it's um it, it doesn't sound well but in context mm -hmm. of machines it does help a lot to understand what the actual data is about and then it simplifies the process going forward Thanks for that, Sean. So just conscious of time, I think let's go around the table and Alison, you will just wrap up on any other questions in them through the Mentimeter. I see Ian, you have your hand. So I'm going to ask you to in your closing message to then perhaps pivot off what Sean has shared. And I'm just going to go around the room last 30 seconds from our panelists, just to, like I say, share on the reflection. And I am going to just go through who I can see on the screen. So I'll start off with Shemaine. Uh, is there anything 30 seconds short and sweet? What's your takeaway from the session or you want to give all away the from the session? All the best <laughs> to all the best to everybody who's going down this journey. The governance around the collaboration is incredibly important. It will really unlock grit. You, unless you have that structure around the collaboration, you will start to to wheel spin. And and certainly, you know, we we found it very useful to have those guardrails. Those are the principles that we stuck to. Some of those were around modernization. We weren't going to do this as a like for like migration. Those principles become your true north. And I really think that they they held us in good stead. So good luck to that. And then secondly, I think you know reach out to participants who have already made use of their migration that you can learn from them and and then be able to adopt that into your environment. But best of luck. Awesome. Thanks, Charmaine. Ian, over to you. Yeah, so from a closing comment perspective, I'd say remember ISO 2022 is a business driven change. Um, take advantage of the opportunity to modernize your standards. Um, and business and technologists need to really be like twins on this journey. 
Um, and then there's just a question that I was trying to respond to in the chat. Um, someone asked about the RMA. In our domestic environment, we don't use the SWIFT uh, relationship management application. We have uh, what is known as a closed user group um, where only members can join that controls um, access from a network perspective. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Ian, for that. Masejo, over to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Larry. Um, last comment, they must remember uh, 2025. They might think it's far, but it's just around the corner. Um, the project will be overwhelming. That is guaranteed. They must just embrace the change and the new learning and the new journey. They must have fun and good luck. Thank you. Short and sweet. Kalani, over to you. I don't know how to top that, but I think from my side, I um, my advice would be that uh, they should start training early and do consider that continuous training uh, throughout the project to accommodate everyone. They need to also establish their structures early and their communication channels to ensure inclusivity uh, between the whole industry and definitely a collaboration. Uh, I think that is what really got us through and all the best. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Thank you. Mariki, short and sweet, over to you. Thank you, Larry, and thank you for allowing the last words. I, I think the important thing that I would like to to share is to reach out to the experts that you already know. Um, the friends of the program is there. Use them, abuse them, um, take advantage of what is already available to us as a community from a PASA structure perspective, from a, Sa a SAMOS perspective as well. And we are absolutely here 100% to support wherever we can. Thank you, Larry. Thanks, Mariki. Norms, over to you. Take it on. Thank you, Larry. You know, on a strategic level, we really need to strengthen our capacity building. Going forward, we're going to need these skills and we're going to have to raise, uh, raise the level of proficiency. So I, I do plead to all the industry players to form part of, of this initiative to make sure that we build technical skills, strong technical skills. We can certify these skills, including the business skills uh, that are linked to the IT222, if it, this is going to be the new language of the future. And the last point is that we now on a flexible standard that allows us to meet compliance, you know, easier than before. There are emerging trends like legal entity identifiers, digital identity that the country is undergoing. When those uh, are brought to the fore, it's going to make it easy for us and this high value payment stream to comply with. Uh, we're seeing trends that the cell phone is, is, is the new bank. And uh, we know in South Africa, Sean talked about the dresses and the dynamics and the complexities there. We know we have a high number of informal settlements in South Africa and in Africa. And GPS coordinates probably as an innovative move might be something that helps us with the location and the address of our uh, consumer network. So I'll stop it there and say, let's take advantage of innovation and, and solve the problems that are unique to Africa. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Uh, also for your tolerance for two minutes over time. I do want to wish you all well. Continue with the journey. Big congratulations to everyone. Thank you to all my beautiful panelists, Sean, Ian, Nasejo, Noms, Kelani, Shamane, Mariki. Thank you very much. Alison, the team at the back. Appreciate everybody's assistance, participants. Let's continue with this journey. Uh, you guys have been awesome, real rock stars. Let's move forward. Let's move onwards. From your host, MC, Larry, signing out. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Larry.